Hello, everyone. I'm sitting here in the wonderful city of Amsterdam in Netherlands with Professor Pierre Capel, whom I met yesterday because we were both giving a talk at the Orthomolecular Medicine Congress in Boezem. We immediately hit it off, and I found out that Pierre happens to be an acquaintance of Wim Hof, also known as the Iceman, who many of you may know of through Tim Ferriss's interview with Wim, and also from the Vice documentary on Wim and his cold and breathing techniques. I'm very honored to have Pierre here. He is an expert on many different subjects, including the science behind meditation, how meditation changes our genes and our brain, and the science behind enjoying life in general. So I'd like to welcome Pierre, and maybe if you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you that I can talk in this fantastic surrounding. Uh, My name is uh, Pierre Capel, and uh, I'm, as the official word is, an emeritus a professor, but I'm just a man who loves science and has now a little bit more time to do his little hobbies than only running a lab with uh, more than 100 people. My hobbies are science, but science also connected to the joy of life, uh, what you just said, because it is incredibly important that we should not only be active and creative, but we also should be at ease that the creation we want to find really has a good background and not all this rush, 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 and ah, no, relax, and then the inspiration comes. It's, I couldn't agree with you more on, on that. You know, I, I recently have been talking about some of the negative effects of the stress and the stress, the chronic stress response and how that literally ages your DNA, it ages your brain. Oh, absolutely. Well, the point is that uh, you have to make a division between very functional stress, which is the natural stress, which has uh, a very big influence in survival, like animals do. So if there is a danger, you should not go to bed and think about it and write an article, but you have to run and fight and do and whatever. So this stress response, which people always know it's uh, linked to uh, adrenaline, uh, heartbeat, sweating, power, uh, that stress response is very good. However, it uh, is rather strong on your body. So if you do that for a too long time, it doesn't work. The other thing is the chronic stress, which is not related to danger, but to stupid thoughts. Oh, worry, what's tomorrow? Wow, if that... That are all type of thoughts which can make you uneasy and give a stressy response. However, there can also be a type of stress which is very real and chronic. For example, a disease in your family. If somebody has leukemia, you can't say, okay, uh, relax or whatever. But if we're going to talk about meditation, which we will do in a moment, what is the very strong point is that this chronic stress which is outside uh, (coughs) your competence to cope with it. It is there. But what is the effect it really has on your body? That you can influence. So the terrible disease is there 24-7, but it should not devastate your life 24-7, but only 20 minutes, poof. And that we're going to talk about, what that will do. So what you're saying is, in a way, if you have an event that is out of your control, for example, if someone in your family gets critically ill, such as leukemia, obviously you can't control that. I mean, no. It's going to happen, and you are going to be affected emotionally by that event. But what you can control is how you emotionally respond to that event and whether or not you're going to ruminate and continue to have these negative thoughts and anxiety and... Well, the anxiety and negative thoughts you absolutely will have. Uh, it's supernatural to float over the real trouble. That, that's not correct. But there should be a period in the day that you quit thinking and start feeling and don't think about tomorrow, but go to at this very moment and uh, try to get rid of thoughts, breathing easily, quieting down. And, after, and that's the fun thing. 
you hardly will believe it, but if you meditate 20 minutes a day, you will change the use of hundreds of genes in your body, and this change is a positive one. And we will explain that during this uh, talk. So essentially buffering the negative effects of sure. the stress with something like meditation. Yes. Also, physical exercise is also very important. So in a lot of psychiatric clinics, they just hang around drinking some coffee, uh, smoking cigarettes and doing absolutely nothing. But if you let them do some physical uh, work or walking or swimming or whatever, that has a direct effect <laughs> on their psychological problems. So you have to stay active, but you have to also contemplate at a proper moment to get your harmony back, which is disturbed by the outside stressor. Yeah, so both exercise and having that time to be mindful and meditate and be in the present moment. They're both, they both serve <coughs> important functions. I, I would like to ask a question to your audience, if you don't mind. Folks, you all have an agenda. You all are busy. You have all obligations. You have to bring this here, get that, do this, do that. And this whole exercise we can summarize as your agenda. Where are you in your agenda? Where is your daily half hour only for yourself and not being busy with whatever? If you really can answer that you have it, then you are okay. If not, you better think about it. You are worth half an hour a day for yourself. And that half hour, if you do that properly, really will have an effect. So I guess the answer, if, if you say, when I sleep, that doesn't count. No. Sleeping is incredibly important. Without sleep, seven days you die. And in sleep is a very active process in which uh, the mind is really reprocessing, uh, changing memory from this side to that side, uh, cleaning up the hard disk. So that's very important. But uh, emotionally, you have to be awake to get rid of the negative thoughts and come to harmony for 10, 15 minutes. And that active process changes the use of your DNA and your genes. The inactive, unconscious sleeping is extremely important, but uh, that will not have this effect as meditation has. So if it can change the expression of over 100 genes which means you can turn genes on, turn genes off. You can do that yourself. How quickly does that happen? Is it <coughs> immediate after meditating? No, no, it is during. Um, I will give a little example that um, there are a lot of measurements done with all type of medical instruments of scans, brain scans, in which you measure activity. And if you put somebody in such a surrounding where you can measure brain function, blood flow, uh, neurotransmitter production and whatever, uh, then you are on real time. And if these people start to meditate, electrical activity, and especially in this part of the brain, changes within 30 seconds, starts to change. Blood flow is changing within 5 to 10 minutes. And so the, even during meditation, you already are resetting a lot of basic functions. But um, if you don't mind, I would like to give a little example about because you say uh, genes are changed and DNA and whatever. I would like to explain a little bit what it really is. People always think that DNA is something static. If we have our DNA passport, you know who you are. Well, forget about it. These 20,000 genes, which is not much, are used in a special way together, in a qualitative different way, in a dynamic way. And uh, it is so complex that the description of the proteins you have, which are the 20,000, isn't saying much. But what are you using? The point is this, that um, there is a technique that you have a DNA chip in which you can measure which gene is switched on and which gene is switched off in a cell. 
that chip you can buy commercially and in a lab you can do the trick and it is a type of dipstick and then you see what is on and off. There was a fantastic research program uh, in which they did this gene expression in white blood cells for people who were loners, socially isolated, had no friends, no contacts and really felt lonely. So not a person who wants to be alone and is happy, but the people who are really... mm, I'm so long. Compared to the same type of people with income, age, uh, disease, background, etc. And these two types of uh, white blood cells, you put a stick in this one, put a stick in that one, and then you have, heaven's sake, a good computer program. (laughs) And then they analyze 10,000 genes and see what's different. In the case that somebody is lonely, uh, in that article was at least 209 elementary functions in life were changed. Inside the immune system, inside me- uh, metabolism, hormone levels and whatever. So a feeling of unhappiness changes uh, a whole use uh, of hundreds of genes. But the other way around... Happiness also changes an awful lot. So there is a lot of stress is related with unhappiness or worry and sorrow. But uh, if you actively try to be happy, enjoy life, not continuously. It is not a, a, a burgundy type of living that only wine women and singing uh, in the German is Wein, Weib und Gesang. Uh, That is not what I'm aiming at. But if you are internally at ease with yourself, that switches on and off genes. It's not only with uh, humans, but uh, there are fantastic experiments with rats. And there is a, a rat strain where the women are very susceptible to breast cancer. So after a certain period of time, so many percent of the women have a breast cancer and That is the way it is. Because rats are incredibly social animals, if you isolate them and give them the perfect room surface, Hilton quality, but alone in a cage, they feel lonely. What you see is that the tumor incidence, which at a certain time is 20% in the population, goes to 80. The tumor size is 84 times bigger and it starts to uh, spread out in the body, uh, metastasize. How is that possible? Only loneliness influences the effect how the tumor develops. Well, if the genes in the, in the human setting, the 209, in the rat, there's a similar thing going on. If a protein is expressed, which is n- absolutely a necessity for tumor to get out of the tissue and to go into another tissue, then it is metastasizing and spreading. If that protein is not expressed, forget about it, (laughs) he can't leave. But if that protein is under control of the gene, which is under control of loneliness, you influence your disease. So having a harmonious life and really feeling okay, actively try to find the good things in life, not by being blindfolded, but actively looking at it, really has an incredible effect of health. The, with, the t- with the tumor um, loneliness study done in rats, that's incredible that they you know, increased the tumor incidence by 60% and the tumor growth and metastasized. Do they, was there any implications in terms of what caused the you know, metastasis? So, so was, there, you know, was there more cortisol or, you know, cortical releasing hormone that increased, you know, factors like VEGF or other angiogenic factors which are known to cause, you know, tumor yes. angiogenesis? So one of the explanations is that uh, VEGF, which is the vascular endothelial growth factor, which is a necessity to form new blood vessels, but also to do the maintenance. The point is that uh, a tumor... Uh, can actively produce VEGF, but can be stimulated by this loneliness. So this, there is a much higher, exp- so the transcription factor 
which is the regulator of a gene, if that is upregulated by loneliness, then the genes which follow this transcription factor will go up. And in this loneliness, you see that uh, a very important protein in DNA regulation is uh, called NF-kappa-B, which is a factor which switches on and off about 200 genes, very strongly involved in the immune response, but also responsible for this vascular growth factor. So loneliness affects NF-kappa-B, affects the growth factor. And um, if you go the other way around, then if you take away the growth factor by harmony, uh, then the FEGF goes down. And a lot of tumors have lousy vessels and start bleeding and become necrotic and they shrink. So it really is a funny effect. So there's really empirical evidence that social isolation, at least in the context of these animal studies, literally increases the inflammatory response via NF-kappa B. That's really uh, very interesting and very important. Uh, I I will give you two funny examples. Uh, One about wound healing. If uh, in an animal situation an animal is wounded, then whether is he he safe or stressed or whatever will affect uh, the speed of the the healing of, of, of its injury. And they did experiments with uh, standardized uh, incision, uh, which had to heal in in animals. And depending if they give extra nest material and extra content by which he was feeling better, the wound healing is feeling more safe. The wound healing increased incredibly, was much faster. But uh, the other example is more uh, in, in another effect, which is coming not really into meditation, but a little bit. There was a boy who was very often se- severely ill in his uh, younger age. And he was laying in a room for days and days and a lot of pain and trouble. But at, in the garden was a beautiful tree, which he could see through his, the window from his bed. And it always gave him mental support, this tree. This tree was supporting his misery. Later on, this boy became a surgeon and uh, started to work, I guess it was Chicago, I don't know which town. But in the ward, there was a long corridor with rooms uh, uh, which uh, patients were treated. But... Along this uh, stretch of rooms, a couple of them were looking to a concrete wall and a couple of them were looking into a park with trees. So then he started to analyze for 12 years all the documentation on surgery, the outcome of it, how long and how well did the patient uh, perform. Guess what? The guys who were... (laughs) laying in the room, looking at a tree, had less uh, pain medication, shorter uh, hospitalization days, uh, was, were doing better and whatever. And the point is that if you look at something beautiful, it's not only beautiful, but it also really works. Yeah, there's, there's a study that came out not too long ago. I didn't read the whole study. I just read the press release. But it found that people that took walks in nature versus, you know, in a metropolitan city area, um, had less clinical symptoms of depression, anxiety. So they're both walking. They're both getting exercise, which we know also has positive benefits on depression. However, something about being immersed in nature had a much more significant antidepressant effect. Sure. Which is... uh, Uh, That's just completely conceivable with with everything you can see in this field. So I had a question uh, in regards to the wound healing and being feeling safe versus being stressed in the animal studies that you were referring to. Um, it, I know that the stress response, at least in terms of cortisol, there's lots of things going on with the stress response, but it uh, dampens the immune 
response. So it actually, you know, your, your immune system doesn't get as activated. Does that have something to do with the uh, delaying or prolonging the wound healing response? Absolutely. So cortisol is an incredibly important hormone. Uh, and it's fluctuating through the day. It's, uh, the, the official word is the circadian rhythm. And it fluctuates. And at night it's low and in day it's high, etc. And it regulates a lot. Every cell has a receptor on its membrane for cortisol, or almost every cell. And the complex of cortisol and receptor goes into the nucleus and is called a transcription factor and regulates 20% of our genome. So one in five genes is under control of cortisol. So if you are stressed, this rhythm is still there, but this whole fluctuation is elevated. And genes are overexpressed in a stressy situation or underexpressed because cortisol can also switch things off. So the best way to say it's bringing things in disbalance with strong effects. So the stress response is not only cortisol, is not only adrenaline, but is far more complex. But the point is that this cortisol, adrenaline, and all these stress hormones do not only affect heartbeat or sweating or anxiety, but also the immune system. And the example is the wound healing, which is under influence of this stress response and changes whether you feel okay or not. But the immune system itself is making all types of factors, and hundreds of them, who influence the central nervous system, who influence your mood, who influence depression, psychosis, and whatever. Uh, a very strong but uh, sad example is that in the early 70s, when gamma interferon was used as a therapeutic agent uh, for a certain type of cancer, the only effect was that all these people who were treated ended up psychotic in the psychiatry ward because gamma interferon influences the immune system but also influences the central nervous system. That is an incredibly complex interrelationship and all type of uh, factors from inflammatory reactions will affect uh, your mind and vice versa, your mind will affect uh, your immune system. And uh, a very important immunological uh, starting component, so the whole starting engine of the immune system, is called the inflammasome. Inflammasome is a very old defense mechanism in every cell uh, what is living. And it is a complex when there is a danger, a stress, it will, uh, individual proteins will come together, form a complex, and will start a defense reaction. In simple organisms, they will only make this and that and that factor. And in our system, we have the same as in plants and whatever, but you get a whole cascade of reactions. So if you trigger the inflammasome in the bowel, uh, it will trigger all these inflammatory things which goes to the brain, and your gut flora is directly linked through this inflammasome to depression. But if you are, uh, are very healthy, physically spoken, and you are depressed, <laughs> factors from the central nervous system go to the immune system, they will start an inflammatory response, and you get a disease from a psychological a stress factor. So you cannot separate mind and body in this. And there are interlinking elements, many of them, and some are more important than others, but uh, the cortisol levels influencing the immune system, the immune system influencing the central nervous system, the central nervous system influencing, etc. So uh, you cannot oversimplify it, but you can really say 
uh, mental problems will give physical diseases, physical diseases will give mental problems, and vice versa. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Uh, you mentioned the interferon causing psychosis when they were using it to treat cancer. I wasn't aware of that study. Um, That's very long ago when I was active. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, there was a, a little more contemporary study done where they uh, where people were injected with interferon gamma, which is pro-inflammatory cytokine induces immune response, caused depression or depressive symptoms. Yes. Uh, but what was, fa- what was fascinating in that study is that there was a, a group that was given the interferon and there was a group that was given interferon and the marine uh, omega-3 fatty acid, eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, which is also anti-inflammatory, they were given EPA with the interferon, and they did not get the symptoms of depression. Mm -hmm. And of course, many different ways in which inflammation is affecting the brain through, you know, this inflammasome, which is, uh, you know, very interesting. I don't know much about, I know about the inflammasome, but I don't know about the connection between directly how it's influencing the brain. I I do know that a lot of these pro-inflammatory molecules and cytokines can get into the brain and um, also the vagal nerve connecting the gut to the brain. But, you know, it's absolutely true. People that are uh, obese, for example, have, you know, type 2 diabetes. Lots of different inflammatory-related diseases are much more likely to also have depression. And depression also leads to, sure. you know, there's cancer yeah. incidence uh, that's more common and, and a, a whole host of diseases. Uh, but I kind of wanted to, to, to circle back and ask you about the meditation and how how the meditation can specifically influence the way you will respond to a stressful event when it occurs. Let's say if someone practices meditation for 20 minutes a day and then something very stressful happens in their life, you know, will they release as much cortisol as someone who doesn't meditate or is that known? Well, there are a lot of studies on all type of effects of meditation and also in the as long as we stay in the immune system you can measure this pro-inflammatory cytokines IL-6 and whatever and you directly influence IL-6 by meditation it goes down but before we go into the molecules and the things i think it's more important to say what the real effect of meditation is meditation is not something hocus pocus or whatever But uh, the point is this, that all the stimuli from the outside world uh, come into our life via our senses, our nose, eyes, ears, but are handled by the limbic system in the brain. That is what uh, popularly is said, between the ears. It's in the middle. That is a very effective, complicated part of the brain, which is almost, uh, well, in, uh, unconscious. It, it's reacting immediately, and it's where your feelings and all type of things are. The conscious part, what Descartes is saying, that is why we are, we, we think so, therefore, that is in the cortex. But uh, the cortex <laughs> is developed in a very short period of time in evolution from a normal cortex to to little neocortex in the human being. And so the hardware is is not so good. So the emotional development of the brain, the limbic system, uh, was a very slow process in which hundreds of different areas work together. One is for pain and fear, the amygdala, and the other one is for this and that for that. And so you have this whole... Uh, complex system and you have this cortex where your motor neurons are that you can move your hands uh, consciously etc however this thinking is beautiful and we can do fantastic things with our conscious thinking but the way back from the cortex to our feelings from so our uh, cognitive functions and our emotional functions there, the hardware is not so good. So if somebody is afraid of a spider, you can talk whatever you want, but they are afraid. You cannot control the fear of spiders, if you have it, with thinking or talking. 
it doesn't work a tiny bit, but not really. So what we see is that emotions and conscious thinking are separate areas in the brain where the consciousness part has concerning for the neurological anatomy not the proper influence on the emotions. The emotions will dominate the thinking and not the vice versa. Well, uh, selling cars is based on that. Every ad is going for the emotions and then you will think, you will stop thinking. <laughs> okay, but uh, what is now the trick of meditation? Meditation is that you will come back uh, to the activity uh, of your limbic system, so where your emotions are, and disconnect it with thinking. And this disconnecting with thinking is incredibly important because the thinking almost always disturbs the balance of the emotions. Uh, If you think that tomorrow is a problem, in the amygdala there will be a reaction and the whole neuronal neural system will give fear and anxiety and whatever. However, there is no tomorrow. You are here. Perhaps tomorrow is not. It is your own invention that tomorrow will be devastating. You will make it devastating. Perhaps it's true, but you can only say so if tomorrow becomes today. So we sit here. If we focus on our emotions here at this very moment and don't think what will happen or what has happened, then you get the normal balance of all the neurotransmitters signaling inside the limbic system. And because it's such an old system, it's rather harmonious. You can lean on it. It, It's okay. But if we think about tomorrow, you get a disturbance. And the only thing what meditation is doing is not changing your life. It doesn't make it better. But this tomorrow and this uh, space-time feeling, but also the ego feeling, I am afraid. Of, I, uh, that's if you disconnect that. And that is a very simple way to do that because the connection between emotions and consciousness are rather weak. So multitasking, they say you can do, but how many things you really can multitask? If there is a lot of this and that and that and that, it, that you can only handle a little thing. So if you concentrate on something which is not thinking, for example, breathing, you concentrate, so airflow in the nose, count, out, and really concentrate on it. You don't have much space <laughs> of solving a mathematical problem anymore because and then if you concentrate where the airflow goes through the and then re and close your eyes and then have a little music and then all of a sudden you stop thinking and you stop losing the uh, time space feeling you you are you get a function of being instead of going, of whatever. And that is what meditation is doing. But as soon as this limbic system comes into the harmonious things, it really controls a lot of stress responses, a lot of hormones, a lot of cortisol, a lot of whatever, but also transcription factors, including NF-kappa-B. So if you meditate, your immune system is different. If you meditate, your stress response is different. And if you meditate regularly, then you have a very fundamental change, a positive one, which really uh, becomes constant. So there are studies in which they measure activity in the left prefrontal cortex, that is this part of the brain. Normally it's a 50-50 activity uh, left-right, but with meditation it shifts a little bit to the left. And in the left part is more the harmonious uh, well-being, uh, feeling okay, instead of the troublesome on the right. And this shift, and you make new neuronal, neuronal connections, new nerve cells are being made, gives you a, a really constant feeling of uh, emotional stability. And uh, you can measure the number of Uh, brain activities at different levels after seven weeks of meditation 
and you see a, a, a fantastic change to the positive. Wow, yeah. I, I remember reading a study where people were that had never meditated before were trained to meditate for eight weeks, and they had changed like five regions of their brain. They had decreased the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. Mm-hmm. They decreased the activity of it and increased parts of the prefrontal cortex. Perhaps it was the left region. I don't remember. Oh, that, uh, that are details, but... Yeah. No, it's true. And so the amygdala, which is uh, part of the fear and pain and trouble sensing organ, is really changing in, in size and function. And, and you're saying, you know, that doing this long-term meditation has lasting effects. And, and so sure. then one would predict that then, you know, not only are you not going to continue to ruminate on the future the things you have to do. I mean, to a certain extent, obviously setting goals and having goals you want to achieve is a good thing, but when it becomes so overwhelming... It it becomes obsessive. Right. And 24-7, then you're absolutely wrong. A goal is fantastic, but uh, at this very moment, we are sitting here, I have zero goals, only to be here, to enjoy your presence, to talk about the things I like, look at the flowers... That is my life now. Do you practice meditation? Yes. Do you do it on a daily basis? Yes. How long? Uh, well, about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I, I made some, some music uh, compositions of a full type of meditative things and uh, of about uh, 20 minutes. And so when the music stops, I stop. Uh, no, you always go on a little. So it's five minutes later than you. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, yeah. And does your meditation uh, focus on the breathing aspects? Or? Well, uh, the point is that with meditation, a lot of people think that it is you really have to go into a Zen mood and your third eye and the chakra this and the whatever. That's absolutely not necessary. Everybody should just do whatever. You do not have to sit in the lotus uh, position. If, if you like it, you do it. But you can walk, uh, you can sit, you can lay down. And the only thing is you have to concentrate on something by which you do not think. Uh, I had very heavy times emotionally, uh, by which uh, I had a l- lot of stress. I turned gray <laughs> in three months. And from a slim boy, I changed into a fat uh, belly <laughs> a person uh, within half a year with, with the same uh, eating. So my whole metabolism was changed by stress, which is called the metabolic syndrome. I know exactly what it is. But in those days, uh, it was difficult to, to get grip on your life. Uh, people dying and little children and problems and really heavy. So I went to a place where... If you have time, you should do that. It's called uh, the Kölner Müller Museum in Holland. It is a national park in which uh, there are hundreds of bikes for free. So you go in, you take a bike, you go through the forest, the fields, the heather fields, you see deer walking. And then after this nature experience, you come in the most beautiful museum where Van Gogh is hanging and beautiful Mondrian, whatever. And in those days when I really had some trouble, I went there, sitting in front of a picture, which I liked, and just looking at the picture for 20 minutes. And then I could cope with it again. So in very stressful situations, you really have to meditate. Now I have a, have a happy life, and I still like to meditate. But the urge uh, of it, especially if you're in trouble, is incredibly big, and you get a lot of power out of it. Yeah. And how you do it, if you look at the picture, look at nature, look into f- floating water, uh, fireplace. Yeah. Uh, you called it. My, my meditation was... I, I've been wanting to meditate uh, again and, and practice it, on a daily basis, it's it's one part of my life that I'm really actively trying to to uh, incorporate something uh, new. And I I uh, used to when I lived in San Diego many years ago, 
before, about 10 years ago. I'm, I'm from San Diego, but I, I grew up, you know, surfing. And I was able to, to meditate while I was sitting on my surfboard looking at the waves coming in because sure. I didn't care about anything else because all I needed to think about was right now <laughs> that wave coming, one, so it doesn't wipe me out and make me drown, and two, because I wanted to catch one and have this fun what ride in. Yeah, so meditation is just coming, coming to, uh, to the current situation now, uh, no time, just to be. And that can be on a wave board, that can be on a bicycle, that can be on the top of a mountain, it can be anywhere, it can be in a museum, and it can. So there is not a strict rule in meditation, and a lot of people make a little fuss about it, how it should be. But it is stop thinking and start being. I really like that definition. I really like that definition of it. You were, you were mentioning when you were talking about the meditation and the breathing techniques, and it uh, reminded me of uh, some of Wim Hof's methods of you know breathing and he does some cold shock. Uh, I've been very interested in the effects of good types of stress on the body. So we've been talking about bad stress, sure, chronic sure. stress. But there's also youth stress, good stress. Oh, absolutely. So maybe we could dive in a little bit because I know that you're very interested in some of the mechanisms and the science behind how cold and how these certain breathing techniques can change different hormones, you know, the endocrine system, immune system. Oh, it changes a lot. <clears throat> the point is, is that, um, first of all, Wim Hof is a very charming man with a lot of stamina and a lot of charisma. And he really know how to talk to people to convince them that they have to do what they think they should not do, like going into an ice bath. Everyone who just thinks I'm going into the ice <laughs> it's a little strange. But he convinces, please do it. And the weird thing is that people like it and get a positive effect. And then you say, hey, how, why? Well, if you go unprepared into ice cold water, zero degrees Celsius or whatever it's in Fahrenheit, um, you have a lot of pain, you get a lot of trouble, a lot of anxiety. It is terrible. Don't do it. However, Wim is training people and they do it and they like it. What, what is the training? The training uh, is, is, it has two components. First of all, uh, a, medita a meditation type of thing. So you really have to come at ease and really uh, uh, try to get rid of, of all the surrounding stress. And then do this breathing technique. The breathing technique itself, you do about 20 minutes, is a type of meditation in itself, but also a breathing technique. So why not have a double-edged sword? sword. And um, this breathing technique, he really specialized uh, in such a way that you change the uh, content of carbon dioxide in your blood and you lower it. Carbon dioxide is, is uh, acidic in water. And if it's out of the, the bloodstream and the tissue, or at least l less, then the pH is less acidic, but more alkaline. Uh, in the normal situation, the acid-alkaline balance, which is called pH, the strict balance is pH 7, and our body is 7.4. That is our regular situation. In the stomach, it's very acidic. Uh, and in that, it's this. So there is a little difference in the body. But let's say 7.4, that is our body uh, equivalence of uh, alkaline and acid. By this breathing technique, and uh, pumping out a lot of carbon dioxide and having periods in not breathing, heavy breathing, and, well, he, uh, he can tell people how to do. You change your pH. And now comes the little trick. That uh, in his uh, training, that type of 
breathing, raises the pH sometimes to 7.7, 7.8. And for biology, that is a lot. Yeah, and this is published. And, this is a, and it is published, it's, it's scientifically yeah. uh, measured and whatever. But we go now back to this uh, terrible cold. If you go, uh, you always have an idea of the temperature of your surrounding. And for that, you have a whole family of uh, receptors, thermosensors, and there's a whole family. And for each temperature range, you have a separate set of family members who are telling you what the temperature is. So if it is above 50 degrees uh, Celsius, rather hot, you will burn. So if you touch something which is very hot, yeah, immediately, you, you can't react differently. You can't keep it on and say, hmm, it smells. You don't. <laughs> uh, but if it is 37 degrees, you say, hmm, nice. And so there is, for each temperature range, is a family of, of temperature sensors, which are proteins which are doing things. And they do not only measure temperature, but also mechanical stress. And uh, so if you feel something, uh, this touch, you feel hey, it's metal, it's colder, it is this. That is this whole family of things. One of the family uh, members is uh, effective uh, beyond 1717 uh, Celsius, so cold. And uh, because our body temperature doesn't want to be lowered, this cold surrounding is aggressive. We should avoid it. So you get an active stress response. Get out of the cold and now. That is this receptor telling you. However, he is not alone. Because if you go in this cold water, uh, it's painful. It's, ah, it hurts. And uh, you get a very strong anxiety response and I have to get out and that's so dominating that it really can cause you uh, a lot of trouble heart attack Uh, so if you go into ice cold water and you are really in trouble the body is telling you that however pain anxiety and temperature they are all combined in this skinny dipping in the cold water but biologically they are separate units and normally the thermosensor tells you it's cold and his job of, of this thermosensor is telling you hey switch on the heat burn your brown fat generate calories like hell make energy 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 in temperature uh, should not drop So burn everything we have to keep your body temperature constant. That is the function of this receptor. But it is coupled to a pain receptor. So you cannot just sit in the water and say, oh, nice, I'm uh, changing my metabolism. You have pain. But now we come to the pain receptor, which is another one. And there's also a family of receptors. And the trick is this. It is a protein in the membrane. And as a single protein, it's doing nothing. But if three of these proteins combine into a trimer, so three, uh, three proteins together in a certain conformation, then they will signal, and that signal is pain. Normal situation, like we are sitting here, let us say uh, that 5% of our pain receptors are in an active state. So if I do this... Well, I feel it, but it doesn't hurt. However, if I have a big wound here and I do this, that, then we get trouble with the neighbors because I shout too or loud. Ah! Because then this not 5% is on, but everything is in the trimer position and generates a pain signal. So a pain signal has a volume uh, switch. Can be low, can be high. But... It is dependent on a lot of uh, things, also inflammation, but also on pH. And at pH 7.7, the pain receptor is a monomer. So it's It's out. So 
no pain. But the same receptor is also in the amygdala, uh, giving fear and pain, but also in the spinal cord and all over your body. So all of a sudden you don't feel pain, don't feel anxiety. But the temperature receptor, which normally gives you pain, is doing now the job by himself only, generates an incredible amount of adrenaline, gives you energy you won't believe, burns your fat like hell, and Wim Hof is uh, able to sit for two hours, or one hour and 58 minutes, or something like that to be precise, in ice cold water without a, a significant change in body temperature. Why? Because his thermal sensor is heating up and burning the brown fat. Come on, boys. And afterwards, you're going to change the white fat into brown fat, which is uh, the brown fat is in this area of your body. And uh, so you regenerate that. And so if you come into the cold, you get a fantastic amount of energy. You get this strong stress response without pain and fear. And then you can walk up a mountain uh, in short time. What's the name of the thermoreceptor? Do you know? Uh, yes, cold. that is uh, whew, um, transient potential the TP. Oh, one of the TPV or RV. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, TPV. There, yeah, there's I a whole family. Okay, yeah, I'm okay so it, the names. it's uh, responding to the cold, and uh, and all, and there are also receptors uh, which are responding to heat and whatever. Right. Yeah. So um, I have so many questions, but one is the importance between coupling the breathing technique, which then decreases the carbon dioxide in the blood and there, as a consequence, Switch raises, the right, but it raises the blood uh, pH to a little more alkaline, which by the way is not easy to do. Usually you can't just raise your, your <laughs> pH in your blood, but you know, breathing, obviously the breathing techniques, obviously sure. it's, it's, it's working and, and that's been published. Um, and that then switches off the the receptor the pain receptor which needs to be trimerized so it's now not able to do that because the pH is too high yeah. so that's uncoupling now the pain receptor from the okay. thermoreceptor which somehow I know that UCP1 the uncoupling protein which norepinephrine which is cold releases norepinephrine and that activates uncoupling protein one which then uncouples your mitochondria so your mitochondria usually are sensing you know the electrochemical gradient and when that becomes uncoupled your mitochondria go oh my god i need to make energy so they burning more you know you're basically burning all the energy like you said yes. to uh you know generate heat and to also make ATP, energy yeah. atp so you end up burning fat like you said um and that this is all really cool because i was for one the the ph changing the ph of the blood i was now, I was a little skeptical of that until I actually read the study and um, <clears throat> and how, you know, carbon dioxide in the blood can do that. I think there's a term for it, like respiratory alkalosis or something Oh, like yeah, that. You, you can name it whatever, yeah. But the point is, it, it's functional. Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you tried any of the breathing techniques or...? Well, uh, no, not in that sense that... Um, but I have a little story. I know a guy who was doing this uh, for the first time, and he didn't take this breathing so serious. So I said, well, I said, okay. Uh, and in the meantime, wandering around, and then uh, hopped into the cold water, and that was extremely unpleasant. And then the second time, uh, he really was aware, hey, <laughs> I should take it serious, this breathing. And then he had no trouble. So this is a control in itself. So the breathing technique is really necessary to prepare for this cold. And this cold will, after uncoupling of all the other effects, will have the positive uh, stress response in metabolism, adrenaline, uh, etc. Without the pain. So, Without the so pain. you can withstand the cold for yes, longer. Yes. I've been very interested in the effects of temperature on um, on the human physiology. I've talked a lot about the sauna and how the sauna is a, a good hormetic stress, activates heat shock proteins, which have a variety of positive effects. It also uh, 
changes brain brain function as well. Um, it changes the opioid system, endorphins, makes you more sensitive to them. So I became very interested in that. Uh, but cold, more recently, I became interested um, because there was a paper that was published in Nature last January where researchers took mice and exposed them to about four degrees Celsius for 45 minutes. Caused their core body temperature, so unlike WIM, their core body temperature dropped from you know, 98.6 to about 65 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so very I mean, hypothermia almost. But what was very interesting is that they, the cold shock, there's a, a whole class of proteins called cold shock proteins that are activated by the cold. And one of them specifically is in uh, the brain and at the dendritic spine region of neurons. And it increases dramatically in the cold. And what's really interesting is that what the function of this protein is, is RBM3, is to regrow lost synapses. So hibernating animals, bears, for example, you know, some hibernating rodents, when they go into hibernation, they lose a significant amount of their synapses. I forgot, like 30 or 40% or something like that. But when they come out of the hibernation, they regrow the synapses that they lost which has huge implications, of course, for sure. neurodegenerative disease, brain aging in general. Uh, so this is kind of what instigated the study because they found that what happens is upon hibernation, they have this huge increase in this gene in the brain, RBM3, and that regulates you know, regrowing the synapses. So uh, that's when I became very interested in the cold and then started reading about it and all the effects on the endocrine system or epinephrine burning of the metabolism. And now I'm very interested in some of the uh, techniques that WIM's doing and the science behind what's going on. So I'm really excited to have you talk about it. And um, so, but you wanted to talk about a couple of other interesting effects on the same family of receptors. Yes. And then we don't go so bizarre as in the heat or in the cold or whatever, but we just go to this family of receptors uh, which uh, the family name is TRP, and then uh, you have Uncle M and Auntie V. And, uh, so the whole family is uh, RTP, V1, or M, etc. Uh, the question is that you have a measurement of each type of temperature by each family member. But now the question is, why in the tropics people eat so spicy? A lot of hot peppers. The point is this, that um, a compound with a beautiful name in uh, the red pepper is binding to one of these family members uh, which senses heat. Not the extreme heat, not the 50, but so around 40 uh, degrees Celsius or so around 100 Fahrenheit. What it's doing that the pepper stimulates this receptor. So the receptor thinks you are too hot. Capsaicin, is that specifically? Yes, yeah. that is the, the name. But uh, the receptor senses, hey, it's hot, and is reducing your body temperature to neutralize the effect of the outside temperature. So you lower your body temperature by spicy food. But if you're in the tropics, you will be heated up by the sun. And if I go as a Westerner, not, uh, well, I like spicy food, but if I haven't done it and walk there, I'm sweating. And then you have this really white man's burden in the tropical, <laughs> you know that, well, um, sorry. But um, whereas if you have spicy food, you lower your body temperature, the sun is raising it, but to the normal level you want, you don't have to sweat to get rid of the extra temperature because you set your thermostat lower. So that is what uh, the hot pepper is doing. Now, the other way, the cold receptor, if you have a cold, you have all these type of uh, things that you wrap your breast with menthol or eucalyptus, etc. The point is that compounds from these plants bind to the cold receptor. So as soon as you rub in your chest, <laughs> it feels cold because you sense cold, like the pepper, you feel hot. But um, the temperature receptor is not only making more energy and whatever, but changing the blood flow. So the blood flow increases in this area where you put menthol or eucalyptus, and you generate heat, so 
first it's cold and then it really is getting warm because you pump up the fire by this plant uh, extract. And the, the trick with cold, why it's so good, and very simple, and you don't need further medication because you can do it yourself, is what is a common cold? If I am for 10 minutes outside and unprotected and I feel cold tomorrow, I'm ill. How is that possible? The point is that this illness is already there, but I can cope with it. So you have a renovirus or whatever cause of my common cold. And my immune system is coping with it. So let's say I have 100 uh, units of immunity, which have to fight to 80 units of uh, a viral or whatever infection. So the immune system dominates the infectious agent, and this is a continuous process. Now I go 10 minutes into the cold. The blood flow changes because the cold gives vasoconstriction, so you have less blood. So my 100 units per time can't reach that place and become 75. Hey, says the, <laughs> the virus, poof! And um, because that goes very fast, uh, half a day or a day later, you have a common cold. So if you now put on uh, some menthol or eucalyptus, by increasing the blood flow and giving a lot of energy and raising the temperature, then the immune system comes back with much more units per time than the 100 and can cope with it. And so therefore, these simple uh, things from plants have a very strong effect. I never knew there was actually any validity behind putting menthol or eucalyptus oil. But you feel it ah, cold and warm. And, ah. I don't remember, like, you know, it's been so long. I was a kid. I think my mom put it on my chest when I was sick. But I, you know, it's been just, it's been decades since I've done it. So I don't remember feeling warm. I, well, you can do it uh, now. <laughs> maybe a, yeah, kind of a burning feeling. Yeah, Is that, yeah. So, okay, let me ask you this then. Why... Why, when you go out in the cold, don't you have the same response? So, obviously, there's vasoconstriction occurring. Um, how come there's not a response then also similarly to then increase the blood flow after? Or is there? Well, the point is that if you go into the real cold, uh, like Wim is doing, yeah. you switch on full-blown all the engines to pump up the fire. But if I walk out here and I go from room temperature to a little lower, I don't have this family member which is reacting at minus 17. My throat is getting minus 24. So I don't activate the receptor Wim is using, which pumps up the whole thing. Oh, I see. And I do with menthol, I go to the low temperature receptor, which I pump up the activity. So a decrease in temperature from 37 to 28, so in your fingers it, it can be 28 or so, uh, that doesn't switch on the receptor which uh, Wim is using in the cold bath. So you, you have to go much further. So if you go uh, into the ice bath, you immediately trigger the subsequent uh, response. If you just walk outside uh, and you're just chilly or whatever, you you do not have the proper family member of the receptor being activated. Mm -hmm. So we need to also be happy when we go outside when it's cold because being happy also regulates our response to this virus and whether or not we're going to fight it off. Oh, yeah. And so it is really important uh, to have a positive view on life. And there are a lot of studies of people who are optimistic or pessimistic and that really makes a difference statistically in how they cope with diseases, life expectance, the number of days without disease. That is directly related to a positive or negative uh, attitude to life. Smell the flowers. Beautiful. Beautiful. And look at them. Oh, yeah. But if we talk about smell, what an effect that has. Oh, Man. yeah. You know, falling in love is based on smell. I didn't know that. You didn't? No. Oh, wow. Pheromones? No, 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 no. no. The point is this, that falling in love always has to do with sexuality and procreation. From nature side, right. let's say that way. So if, uh, if somebody 
uh, wants a partner and wants children, they want to know if they are okay uh, and if the genes are really properly fitting. A lot of genes are the same. So uh, a gene for uh, insulin making is, is, is the same in all people. But there are also genes which are extremely different, uh, polymorphic, so many forms, polymorphic, which is especially in the immune system. Each individual has a different immune system. Each has an individual set. For that uh, complexity, you have proteins, which are the major histocompatibility complex, MHC or HLA, transplantation antigens, etc. They differ from person to person. And I am, for example, uh, have a immunological setting, say that I can have no trouble with malaria, no trouble with yellow fever, but I cannot handle influenza. Now I meet, uh, I, I will encounter a woman who also can handle yellow fever, also malaria, and cannot cope with influenza. If we mate, that is a pity that the child has nothing new. So I have to find someone who copes with influenza and I give a damn about the yellow fever because that are my genes. So I want to know the gene passport. Uh, animals are doing that. Uh, if you walk your dog, they immediately sniff. And the olfactory uh, system in the nose is extremely fantastic and is highly polymorphic. So everybody has an other smell perception. Therefore, you have all these racist uh, things that uh, these people, uh, the whole group of people smell. Well, no, <laughs> my perception is genetically different from there. So I'm stinking for them and vice versa because each nose is different. Okay, back to the immunology. It is important to give the uh, child as many defense possibilities as, as possible. You, for mathematical reasons, you cannot have a total immune system fighting everything because then you are included and that includes autoimmunity. So immune system is defense against the outside minus myself. And I should not turn to myself. But um, to make a long story short, these vital molecules, which are different in each individual, are being chopped up in little peptides and secreted by all type of body fluids, which uh, are in the armpits and between the legs and in all the sexual organs and sweat. There they are secreted. Uh, and as soon as you smell them, you know how the immune system of the other person is. And so therefore you come into the area that smell is an important thing for genetic selection with whom you have to mate. A uh, certain type of fish, all fish doing that, swimming together, exchanging smell. If that's okay, then the wife, the woman puts her eggs down and can be fertilized by the man. If not, she's not putting any eggs down, he has to go. Uh, dogs it's, uh, and people, mice, uh, you name it, all type of studies. Uh, so therefore smell is important. And then you come to the thing, and I don't know, uh, uh, the American population is always, you can't talk about things too much, uh, but let's talk about pubic hair. Uh, that's not there for protection or warm or whatever. Holy moly, it's warm enough. <laughs> Uh, and children don't have it because they are not sexually active. So as soon as you become sexually active, you have to distribute your smell, uh, your little molecules as much as possible. So you need a big surface. So therefore, in the areas where a lot of in, uh, these molecules are secreted, uh, you get a lot of hair to increase the surface and uh, to select and it is impossible to make love from somebody whose smell you don't like. That doesn't mean that there is a strong smell. It can be stinky like hell, but you still like it. And if you don't like it, forget about it. <laughs> that is really fascinating. I, first of all, I had no idea that you uh, 
secreted the immunohistocompatibility complex. You chopped it up. You, yeah. you chopped them as little and, peptides. And secrete them as, uh, in, in yeah. your sweat and other bodily fluids. Well, we, I think we can go on for a long time. I, well, this has been a very interesting conversation, Pierre. I really, really enjoy uh, talking with you. We have a lot of common interests. Yeah. Uh, if, if people are more interested in hearing uh, or learning more about what you are researching or your, the talks you give or anything about you, is there a place where they can find you on the interwebs? Well, I do have a website, uh, which is the first three W's and then meditation to go. Uh, but that is a site I do not actively support so much. It's it's still okay. I'm now working at another one, and which will be pierrecapel.nl. And there is my activity on meditation, but also on science. But also how you incorporate quantum mechanics into biology and things like that. So... Uh, but that is now under construction, so please wait. But for your audience, I really want to say... Why don't you take half an hour for yourself per day? What is so important in the outside world that you keep on running? Oh, I have to do this. Uh, oh, and I'm, blah, blah. where are you in this situation? Please make this choice for yourself. Half an hour a day keeps more than only the doctor away. <laughs>